Hello, hello. Hey, Ella, how's it going? Hi, Seth. How's it going? I'm doing great. So, you and I are, I would say, a bit closer than most uh, most fireside chat duos, mm -hmm. in that we uh, have started a company together, uh, in which we currently run. Um, we we live together. We are we're raising a, a baby together. Uh, in this case, a real human uh, nine-month-old baby. Uh, and unlike most uh, co-founders, we, we sleep together. Yep. So we've got that. Um, <laughs> and so uh, I guess the kind people at Slush, uh, some of them are inspired by our, our work and our lives, and so asked us to share a little bit of the behind the scenes of how things work in the world of, of, of Ella and Seth. Um, and so this... this Talk is very unusual for us. Normally, we are uh, talking about how to combine profit with purpose, or how to commercialize scientific research, or how to build legendary companies. This is uh, much, much more personal. Yeah, and there's two things to get out of, out of the way. One is we fully acknowledge we're the last thing between you and the party. And the second thing is that... Um, yeah, unlike the two characters in the Mr. and Mrs. Smith movie, um, we are not uh, super spy assassins uh, working for competing uh, agencies. Um, or are we? <laughs> it's true. Our, 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 uh, our life is not very Hollywood, but it is, uh, I would say, very Silicon Valley. We uh, were two entrepreneurs. We met in Y Combinator, Silicon Valley startup boot camp, fell in love. Uh, and then ended up starting uh, a company together, which which we now uh, run, a tech a tech firm. Um, and so we, we we've found great meaning by uh, being able to back entrepreneurs solving the world's uh, biggest problems through technology entrepreneurship. Our entrepreneurs are addressing the climate crisis, defeating disease, ending malnutrition, connecting the unconnected. But we've also managed to uh, infuse the organization that we run 50 years with a lot of the values of, of our relationship. Empathy, vulnerability, humor, and even love. Yeah, and I think in the early days we were um, really struggling to, like, so we started six years ago, and in the early days we were, um, like, you know, we were trying not to lean into too much into the fact that, like, we're partners in life and we're partners in, in the firm and I think we thought it would be this impediment for the founders we talked to and for the investors we talked to for LPs and and uh, for the team we ended up when ended up hiring and I think um, yeah like th there were those moments when when we um, I know you were like dreading uh, questions about that right yeah when we would be pitching LPs LPs are investors in VC funds we would be dreading the moment that they would inevitably ask um, wait a minute are you two uh, a couple um, and we, we dreaded it so much that we, we worked to find other examples. Maybe there are some of great organizations founded by, by romantic partners. And it turns out that there are quite a large number. Companies like Eventbrite and Cisco and VMware and The Gap Canva. and Canva. Yeah. Uh, and even some great VC firms. Uh, y Combinator, uh, of which we are alumni, was founded by romantic partners. Lowercase Capital, arguably the most successful VC fund of all time. Yeah, and I remember we also we would commonly have this question when we were getting off 50 years off the ground, like how can can this ever work? Like, has there ever been a, a, a successful VC firm that was started by partners? And then, you know, arguably one of the also most more successful firm uh, venture funds is is Y Combinator, started by PG and Jessica. So. When I think when we fully internalize that we're going to lean into this thing, this is who we are, um, um, things became really much more productive. So in preparation for today, we're thinking, you know, the Slush team uh, was very excited to have us talk about sort of work life uh, uh, behind the scenes of, of 50 years. And we wanted to make sure this is also uh, generalizable and, and there are some principles that, that, that we realize that we have. and we will tell you more about them that um, hopefully can be useful for everyone else. So uh, there's a few of those operating principles that, um, uh, um, uh, that we, we've seen. And the very first one, and the one that is the most guiding principles of everything we do at 50 years, and I think it's, it's a common guiding principles of many entrepreneurs, is uh, throw your cap over the wall. And what does it mean, Seth? So... Um this 
a phrase, throw your cap over the wall, actually is an analogy um, that uh, uh, comes from this old Irish story about a bunch of Irish kids who were on this great adventure. Um, and on this adventure, they came across a wall that just seemed too high to possibly scale. But they really wanted to continue the adventure, get, get over to their side. And so they took off their caps and they threw their caps over the wall, forcing themselves to figure out a way uh, of climbing over. Um, and, and you know, if we all think about our own lives, there are so many times where we come across a wall that seems uh, impossibly high to climb. Uh, there are times we come across obstacles that just seem too difficult to solve. Um, and what we found is that approaching these obstacles with this mentality of throwing your cap over the wall, just taking the first step, such that you then have to figure out uh, the next step uh, to actually get to the conclusion you want, uh, is a really, really valuable uh, valuable way of thinking about things. Yeah, so even when we were just getting started, uh, I was a partner at another fund, Seth was still running his Y Combinator company, and uh, we would always have this vision that one day we're going to start this uh, firm that's only backing uh, companies that are using technology to solve uh, biggest problems in the world. And it was always this mission, uh, this vision that, you know, uh, one day when we're done doing what we're doing, you know, maybe five, maybe 10 years from now, we're going to do it. And I think in like a very entrepreneurial spirit, I think uh, two or three months into this conversation, uh, we emptied our bank accounts. We, at that time, lived, were living in, the, in New York City. We moved to moved back to Silicon Valley when, when we, where we first met at YC. And we um, moved into a house, and this I think will ma make some, 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 some of you happy, uh, which was called the Moomin House. It's a house in San Francisco that looks exactly like the house from the Moomin cartoon. And we lived with, 14, uh, with 12 other people, so 14 other people, because this was, um, and we lived there for two and a half of the initial years of running a venture fund, because this was what we could afford, having emptied our banks accounts. It was before my other company was acquired. We, we were uh, definitely, we even went in debt to, 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 to get things off the ground. But it was, it, it wasn't waiting for the perfect moment. It was essentially saying we're doing it and, and it's going to get done by the nature of us committing to getting it done. And I remember when we first, it sounds quite dramatic when you, when I talk about it right now, but the experience of, of, of what it meant to throw the cap over the wall at that time was that, um, um, I remember the night we signed our first docs for a very small fund. We just started with like a prototype fund of, of, of a little over $4 million uh, six years ago. Uh, we uh, signed our first docs. We had our first LP, first investor. I think we immediately committed to back a company. And, and that experience of that was that I was crying that night and I was like, oh my God, I really hope we can like raise the rest of the f fund because like otherwise we're like in real financial trouble. So like throwing the cup over the wall, it's like not always the easiest way, but it's, it's like the fastest way to start sort of the snowball of the progress. And the personal side of the story is, um, uh, I think it's, 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 a, it's a personal example, but I think it's exemplary of, of how we operate and, and how now 50 years with this bigger team operates is that um, I was in New York City uh, in between uh, jobs on a sabbatical and I was studying contemporary dance just for fun. And I had a student visa, but I was already working as an investor so I stopped going to the dance classes and I got a phone call from my school. Hey, your visa got canceled. You had 24 hours to leave the country. Leave the country. And a few months into our relationship, we were like, okay, let's just bike to the city hall and get married um, so we can stay in the uh, country. And it, it was the same sort of like, let's do it and then commit to making it work. And Six years and later, it's working out. Yeah, we have, yeah. A, have a baby. My, my incredibly concert. romantic yeah. email uh, <laughs> was just an a, a email, and all it had was a link to the immigration services website on getting a green card through marriage. And my, my romanticism paid off there. Um, so, you know, this idea of throwing a cap over the wall, if, if you're going to start, if you want to start a VC fund, right, you could spend months and months researching how does one do that. You could talk to a lot of people, or you can just immediately start one and then figure it out along the way. Um, and there are a lot of advantages of throwing your cap over the wall. You, you get started faster. The pace of learning through doing tends to be much faster than just studying without doing. But there are also a, a lot of downsides, because if you are learning through doing, you are inevitably going to make uh, a lot of mistakes. Um, when we started the fund, <laughs> We uh, leaned on our own entrepreneurial experience raising money, and so we thought it would work the same way. And so we, we pitched uh, a lot of VC funds 
to invest in our VC fund. Um, and so we'd get, a lot of these funds would, would take the meeting and we'd have these great conversations and then it would come time for the ask and we'd say, hey, do you want to invest <laughs> in our fund? And, and then we would just get a lot of, uh, a lot of chuckles. It well, uh, didn't always work out so well. Yeah. Yeah, so that's throwing your cap over the wall. Another operating principle that we have is one that uh, this guy is deeply passionate about, and it's this our very specific riff on uh, work-life uh, balance. Um, said, uh, what does work-life balance mean to you? Uh, that, that phrase fills me with intense rage. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I despise that phrase, uh, work-life balance. It's, it's, very, it's very bizarre to me that it's even made it into the, the lexicon because we don't, you know, we don't have the same phrase about hobby life balance or friendship life balance or family life balance, right? When you, when you talk about balance, you sort of imply that there's a scale and you have two things on the scale and they're sort of uh, I I opposing uh, each other, right? They're pushing against each other. Um, but, uh, you know, friendships... Uh, augment life, and they're a part of life, and hobbies augment life, and they're a part of life. And if if you're if you ever feel like your hobbies are out of balance with your life, you just get new hobbies. And mm -hmm. same thing with friendship. Family may be a little bit harder to get get rid of family, but um, I think this idea of work-life balance uh, sets up an expectation uh, that work and life mm -hmm. need to be opposed to each other. And so we we much prefer approaching uh, work and life through the lens of work-life harmony. Right, where you, you can have these two things become sort of integrated, right? Where you're, um, some of our greatest friendships um, are with the entrepreneurs that we work with. We have um, invited some of our entrepreneurs to join us uh, at our Burning Man camp and camp with us. Uh, the, the head of our Burning Man camp joined our team. Um, and we've attended, I think, maybe two, two or three weddings of our founders over the last last year. And, months, yeah. Yeah. And I, I, we love European tech, um, but I think one of, the, one of the special things about Silicon Valley is that, that this idea of work-life harmony is, um, is pretty core to the culture of the place. And it allows for much deeper bonds, deeper connections, which can then lead to both more fulfilling friendships, but also uh, much more productive professional relationships. Yeah, there's many problems even with San Francisco as a city, but, uh, but still it's a place where a lot of people intentionally move to um, make something happen. So there's this like very natural flow between um, what people are working on and, like, what, and, and just the friendships they make. And, and it's just a very dense network of people who are sort of on a very similar journey, which, which, is, really, which is really great in yeah. many ways. And so um, I, I think this, this, this sort of idea of um, integrating work and life is, is very core to who we are. I don't think we could really Im imagine ourselves yeah. uh, living any, any other way, which, which brings us to uh, another principle that we like to live by. Yeah, it's the, another, the, another principle that um, uh, we live by is uh, lean into who you are. And it, there's, there's many levels of it, and I think it comes with sort of us doing what we're doing for the last few years and just there's some confidence in us being able to do it well. But um, it's essentially trying to, um, you know, we are partners in life, we're, we're partners uh, um, uh, at 50 years. We were humans and we're humans with very specific set of values and interests. And um, uh, we see that in many of the companies we back that, that, that the cultures they create and then when those, com their, those companies kind of operate at their best, it's really when they sort of fully and un unapologetically infuse who they are into those organizations and, and actually uh, lean into their eccentricities and lean into those things that like, often there's this like initial instinct to like hide it because there's something really vulnerable about that. So I think we realize at some point, we, you know, that um, um, when we lean into the fact that, you know, we, we are together and then like we maybe thought like maybe that would be uncomfortable for some of our, our team, team members or for some of the founders we back and we actually uh, learned that um, 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 people really love it. I mean, there's, it's, it's, it's just kind of us showing up authentically and, 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 and people see that authenticity and I think there, it, it sort of is helpful in, in many of the really vulnerable conversations we end up having. So we think companies and organizations should lead into who they are and, and, and embrace it and there's also a, there's also a, a personal uh, side of it where um, 
um, sort of everybody comes, I mean, most founders we work with, and, and I'm sure everybody in this room has some superpowers. And then the question is like, how can you even stronger lean into those superpowers and, and then acknowledge the things you're not great at, and then hopefully surround yourself with the people who are great at what you're not great at. But, um, you know, for, for, um, uh, for, for Seth, I, I guess the superpower would be that like, if he really cares about something, he doesn't, he doesn't, um, he doesn't mind what people say. Like he, he's like not afraid to like rough some feathers, which is like not the skill that I naturally would have. Like I'm, 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 I'm much more of a, um, of like a conflict avoidant, like wanting, wanting to make, maybe not, a, maybe that's not maybe the, the, the full, um, uh, fullness of it, but, um, this is that superpower. And then like, he's not definitely not a spreadsheet person and definitely not a process person. And then instead of like trying to become great at this, it's much more important, um, for him, for example, to lead, lean into this. And, yeah. and for me, like I'm extremely sensitive and that comes with the baggage of maybe occasionally getting overwhelmed but like my superpower is um, uh, being a people uh, x-ray and like I just have really strong intuition and that in the world of tech and in the world of everything we do uh, it's still very much a world of people operating those companies and that ends up being very very impactful for early stage um, investing and that makes me a really great investor and it, it came with some, you know, a degree of um, vulnerability for me to, uh, to to acknowledge that as well. And very pragmatically, uh, l leaning into who you are and being authentic to yourself and letting your eccentricity shine comes also with some downsides, right? Mm -hmm. um, because it's very scary because you think, oh, some people might be turned off by this. Um, yeah. you know, I think one concrete example is uh, Forbes Poland uh, decided to do a, a cover story on Ella um, and they sent a, f a photography crew while she was eight months pregnant. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the photographer was sort of asking like, oh, do you want me to, you know, hide, hide the pregnancy? And, and she said, no, this is who I am. I'm, I'm a businesswoman. I'm eight months pregnant, you know, show it. And so the article, you know, uh, didn't mention anything about the pregnancy, but in the photo, she was clearly pregnant. And there's no doubt in my mind that there may be some very conservative, you know, people out there uh, who, who might have been turned off because of that, right? But uh, a lot of, especially younger female entrepreneurs mm -hmm. were really attracted to the fact that Ella felt comfortable doing that. Um, and just sort of, Pragmatically, the way we integrate some of these things into our culture, um, you know, you probably have been able to tell we don't really <laughs> like uh, cor corporate. Um, corporate culture or corporatist mentality. Um, we much prefer a more human approach where you get to know people uh, in a more casual way. Um, and so one way we've incorporated that into the 50 years culture is every, every headquarters we've ever had has been a residential home um, that we just happen to uh, not live out of, but work out of. Um, and always the uh, offices convert to guest bedrooms. So when our founders are in from out of town, uh, the, the, they'll crash with us. It's a shoes off policy. Um, our current one actually has uh, a sauna, which is if there are Finns in the audience, you'll be happy to know it was actually made in Helsinki and imported into San Francisco, which we're pretty happy about. <laughs> um, and another way we, we incorporate um, this uh, very pragmatically into 50 years is uh, empathy, and particularly empathy for the founder journey is very important to us. And we realize that a lot of the common lingo of venture capital um, mm -hmm. tears one away from founder empathy. Um, a, a lot of the very common terminology that people don't think much about. For instance, um, oftentimes this term, this term exit is used, right? When a company gets sold or IPO, they say, oh, it was a great mm -hmm. exit, right? Um, and it seems innocuous, but if you really think about it, uh, the founder journey does not end when a company gets sold or a company IPOs. Uh, if a company IPOs, the founder might be with the company for another 20 years. Uh, if a company gets sold, the founder is almost certainly with the, with the acquiring company for two to three more years, right? And so this idea of VCs calling it an exit um, is actually not really accurate to what the founder experiences. And so we, we, avoid, we, avoid words like, uh, we avoid words like that. Yeah, we have a whole list of forbidden words and uh, there's a swear jar where you, I, it, swearing is actually for, for a game when it's actual swearing, but when you use words that uh, diminish the founder empathy, that's when um, you end up paying money to the, to the, to the 50 year swear jar. Um, yeah, and I think the, the final, uh, the final um, operating principle that we thought it would be good to talk about is uh, this idea of uh, us being happy warriors. And what that means, happy warriors, is this um, term that we started using to um, 
to talk about the team and talk about the 50 years founders that we partner with, uh, maybe about two years ago, I think we like, uh, it crystallized. And it's this idea that like, for the work that we're doing and for the work that many of the founders are doing, it's, um, it's very important to like, to, to have that, the mindset of, um, of positivity. And it's not, you know, either some people are born with more of this mindset and some people are, 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 are not. It's this, it's this constant work to be showing up um, in a way that, uh, that, that helps advance the work. So we have founders who are working on the climate crisis. We have uh, founders who are working on ending animal agriculture. We have founders who are working on, you know, uh, ending malnutrition. And it's, it's hard. I mean, there's like days that are good, there are days that are bad. And the way it um, we cultivate the culture of happy warriors is we, uh, we take care of ourselves. We, you know, look into the research of, um, of, you know, how does sleep, sleep impact us? How does, you know, what are the things that can like lower the cortisol levels that we have, which is like, you know, s stress hormone. Um, and it is sort of exercise, good diet, uh, sleep. Um, for me personally, I mean, Seth is more naturally a serotonin factory where he just essentially wakes up happy and jumps up out of bed and he's like ready to do the work. Um, um, for me, it was much a much bigger journey of of you know discovering meditation and and running and we have uh, we encourage founders to go uh, through therapy if they need to and have coaches and it's this creating this support environment when where people can be the happy warriors and do the work because it's you know we're talking about hopefully trying to contribute in a, in a really positive way to some really massive, massive challenges. And, and that just hard on, on an individual. So um, yeah, we lean into that every day. That's, uh, that's one that like we discuss every day and like it's people's personal responsibility, especially on the team, um, to be happy warriors. So we, we've been super fortunate to have uh, built together an organization that's thriving, uh, a, a romantic relationship that's deeply fulfilling, um, and now I've started a family with a, a non-corporate mm -hmm. human uh, a baby. Um, and so, oh, oh wow, that's a very weird <laughs> way of putting uh, it. The, the <laughs> principles we shared have been have been super uh, useful to us in, in navigating uh, both of those things, and hopefully they're they're useful to, to all of you. And so, at uh, first, I want Ella, I want to thank you for being a great partner in in all of the things. Yeah. Um, and then thank and then you. second, I want to thank uh, you guys for for going the abundant free drinks and and food at a lot of the uh, after parties to to hear us ramble on for uh, for 20 minutes. Cheers. Yeah. Thank you.